This is an anime recap video, and in this video, I'm going to show you a reincarnated girl named Ivy, who becomes a powerful tamer after her parents banish her from the family. The story start with Femisha desperately escapes under the moonlight as her village people chase after her. The village chief, her father, proclaims that she will bring misfortune to their village. He thinks that those with no stars should not be allowed to exist in this world. Day breaks, and our reincarnated girl rushes to her various hiding places around the forest. She retrieves her magic bags and stashes them with cookware, books, potions, and other essentials. Femisha is just relieved that her pursuers only found her hiding place that was close to the village. It is then revealed that she was killed in her past life and is reincarnated to this world. She has hazy memories of that past life and only receives whispers from her former self at certain times. Femisha informs her old self that she has given up on happiness long ago because of everything she has been through so far. She retrieves her dagger and makes the resolution to cast out her village from her heart since they have rejected her. A reincarnated girl tries to proceed forward but is unable to climb a hill, causing her to tumble down and almost fall over the cliff. A reincarnated girl wishes she had useful skills like everyone else. Her past self advised her not to complain about the way she was born, otherwise, nothing would ever start for her. She heads down the cliff and finds a dumping ground. The excitement on her face suggests that this is not her first dumpster dive. Femisha rummages through the trash and finds some clothes. A map falls out of one of the pockets, and she picks it up as it could make her journey easier. Our reincarnated girl also finds some expired potions. Even though their color has changed, she feels like they might still be usable. She finds it ironic that an unwanted child like her survives on trash that no one wants. Her thoughts are interrupted when she hears a tamer approaching. The man feeds his slimes by ordering them to eat the trash. She realizes that he's after her when the man alerts his colleague that our reincarnated girl couldn't have gotten far. He speculates that she went to Lof, which is the nearest village, but they feel like the chief has gone too far by putting a bounty on a little girl. Our reincarnated girl listens in horror as the men reveal that the detail is dead or alive. She takes it as the village head has the intention to eliminate her. She quickly puts some distance between her and her pursuers but ends up falling down a cliff. She's saved when her bag snags on a branch. She gets injured and must use multiple heal potions because they are old and lack potency. A reincarnated girl later comes across a clear river and decides to take a plunge. The freedom to relax is new to her because she has spent her whole life hiding. She promises to be bold and resolute because that is what she always intended to do. The fortune teller also advised her to be like that. She also told her to disguise herself as a boy when she travels because it'll be less dangerous. Our reincarnated girl cuts her hair and changes her clothes into something more appropriate. She also decides to change her name to match her new identity. Her past self suggests the name Ivy because it's the name of a plant that thrives even when stepped on. As she proceeds forward, her attention is drawn to a slime that emits orbs of light. Ivy finds it so cute. Upon closer inspection, she checks her monster compendium and finds out that it's a rare slime with no name. The creature gives her a smile while she reads that it's referred to as the weakest slime or the disintegrating slime. It's the weakest of its kind, just like her, so she resonates with the creature. A sudden light breeze of wind blows the slime across the meadow. She reads that the slime is so weak that it can disappear with just a poke. It will also disappear if the wind blows too hard. She carefully helps it up as it struggles to reorientate. She learns its lifespan has been confirmed to be under a day because it's so weak. A look of sadness is seen on her face after hearing this. This due to rare encounters and their short lifespan, everything about them remains unknown. A stronger gust of wind blows the slime again, but Ivy saves it before it falls into the river. She decides to stay with it since it is destined to disappear. That night, Ivy reveals that humans and Origo receive skills when they turn five years old. Her father has two-star carpentry and processing skills. Her mother has two-star needlework skills and a one-star mending skill. The gods decide the skill and the number of stars one gets. Everyone's future is decided by these standards. When Ivy was five, she received a taming skill, which is the ability to tame monsters and win them over. Unfortunately, she didn't receive any stars. Her reincarnated girl is a starless tamer. She can't even tame small animals, not to talk of monsters. Everyone in the village's attitude changed when they found out. Even her kind father and mother gave her the cold shoulder. Her place of belonging was gone. She told the slime about her past life and the fortune teller who taught her so much and gave her lots of books to read. One of her magic bags was given to her by the fortune teller. It holds a lot of things without feeling heavy, which is handy. Ivy starts to cry when she reveals that the fortune teller passed away recently, and with that death, she feels like she has lost everything. 
there isn't anyone to look out for her now, but she's glad to have met the rare creature. The following morning, she wakes up and anxiously looks for the slime. A tear runs down her face when she realizes that the monster has disintegrated. Her response is a surprise to her because she thought she was used to the loneliness. She tries to get motivated by heading to the royal capital as instructed by the fortune teller. Ivy pulls out the map from her bag and is shocked to see the slime inside. She unravels the paper, happy to see that the creature has not disappeared. She confirms that some of the information in the compendium must be inaccurate. They head inside the forest where Ivy finds the page on how to tame a monster. She channels some of her magic into the slime. It glows because it has accepted her. At this stage, she names the monster Sora, and a mark appears on the forehead of the rare creature indicating that the taming was successful. She happily holds the creature and introduces herself as she's excited to get to know it better. She later lays a trap and captures her 10th field mouse. She shows her appreciation for its sacrifice before butchering it. Ivy wonders why her past self always gets startled every time she dresses her prey. She begins to wonder what her lifestyle was like in her past life. As Ivy speculates, she neatly packs the broken down meat into leaves. She informs Sora that they will feast that night. Our reincarnated girl has taken a page from Moda's book as she keeps her slime stashed in one of her bags too. Ivy gets her map out again, but the royal capital is not even depicted on it because it's so far away from her current location. So she decides to head to the town of Otwa first. A sudden breeze comes in again and almost blows Sora away, but Ivy catches him in time. Her attention is drawn when she senses that something is coming toward them, so she quickly escapes into the trees. Shortly after, a unit of monster ants passes by. She breathes a sigh of relief when they leave without incident. As she holds Sora, she realizes that he has gotten a little bigger and heavier. The sting from the wound on her face becomes obvious to her. Our reincarnated girl speculates that she got a cut from the branches earlier. She feels like she needs to tend to it before it festers. She pulls out multiple expired blue potions and rubs them on her face till the wound heals, but realizes that she's completely out. Ivy comes out of the forest and onto the beaten path since she's getting closer to the village. She notices the wanted posters pasted along the roadside with a reward of 500 dal. She wonders why they would place such a large sum of money on her. Her past self informs her it's because she's a fugitive. She notices that there are different depictions of her on each poster, some more flattering than others. She continues along the roadside and finds herself in the village where she is reminded how much skills and magic are the backbone of normal life. She passes by a bakery and is reminded that she hasn't eaten any kind of bread in a long time. Ivy also passes a butcher and gets the idea to sell the field mice she hunted earlier. However, she's a little timid to approach. The butcher notices this and calls her over before she removes the meat. He already knows that it's field mice because he has a two-star odor skill. He inspects it and is happy with the freshness of her catch and her butchering skill. She presents the rest of her wares, which are bought for 100 dal. The butcher is more than happy to buy more if she catches them because all the other hunters are targeting big game these days. She heads to the bakery and buys some bread and is surprised by how cheap it is. The owner finds her naivety cute. The people in the village assume that she's a boy. This means her disguise worked perfectly. Ivy goes somewhere quiet to enjoy her bread. She gives half to Sora, but the slime doesn't want it. She learns that the creature means no when it spreads itself out. She wonders what type of food this rare slime eats. The following day, Ivy goes into the forest and gets a large haul of field mice. As she returns to town, she comes across a dumping ground where she finds plenty of expired potions. As she sorts them out, Sora jumps on the pile of blue potions and ingests them. Ivy thinks that he can dispose of trash. The ability to dissolve inorganic materials is something only high-level rare slimes can do. She tests this out by placing a vase for it to eat, but Sora turns his face. After a few more tries, she realizes that the creature only likes to eat blue potions. She pleads for it not to eat everything as she also needs it. Ivy returns to the village and sells her haul for 250 dal. She heads to the bakery to get a variety of breads, and the owner even throws a free one for her. She goes to the nearby stream to clean off before eating her bread. Ivy relishes this moment, wishing it could last forever. She makes her way back to the village and stumbles on some adventurers. She is spotted by her pursuers, but they don't recognize her because of her changes. They rather tease her, thinking she's a little boy. Ivy hurriedly excuses herself. She gets to the butcher shop and the bakery and realizes that her wanted poster is up. The owner of the bakery even offers her some free bread but she's so terrified of being found out that she leaves. A reincarnated girl is upset that she must leave the village because her wanted poster has arrived there. 
What pains her most is that the people were so nice. The following day, she proceeds to her next destination since her hunters have caught up with her. Ivy later arrives at a crossroad and wonders which way her trackers went. Sora tries to hint something at her, but she doesn't understand. Ivy now regrets not taking the free bread offered to her because now she's hungry with nothing to eat or drink because she left in such a hurry. She picks her path and hears water along the way. Ivy even finds a tree with the most delicious type of fruits. As she approaches, Sora does his disapproving gesture while shivering. The reason comes apparent when the tree turns into a monster spitting out her pursuers. The tree lunges at her with one of its roots, but Sora knocks her out of the way just in time. She manages to get to safety, but she loses strength due to the wound she sustained on her arm. As she loses consciousness, our reincarnated girl notices Sora jumping on the wound and thinks that her slime is eating her since some digest people. Ivy looks at the slime and believes that it will eat him, but realizes that she is an unwanted child and there's no place for her in this world, so she should probably be dead. Just then, she falls unconscious and thinks about her life. Her mother gave birth to her, and her father decided to call her Famisha, revealing that she will bring happiness to their life. Three years later, she sits with her family and eats some bread. Her brother teases her, saying that she is eating like a wolf, but our reincarnated girl informs him that she wants to grow up, and for this, she wants to eat a lot. At the house, her sister Facilla tells her to use some everyday magic so that she can be helpful to their family. But her mother shuts her away, saying that everything develops at its own pace, and Famisha is just three years old. For her to receive magic powers, she must reach the age of five. Two years later, her father, a three-star furniture artist, makes her some toys with wood, and she continues to play with them. Just then, her mother, a two-star sewer, begins to cry. When asked the reason behind it, she tells them that she is stitching the bridal wear for the shoemaker's daughter. But it made her realize that her daughters, Facilla and Famisha, will go off to be brides too and will leave their house to live with someone else. Suddenly, her father, ignoring the sentiments of his wife, informs them that at the age of five, every child receives a skill and stars which will help them to earn money in this world. However, no one knows what type of skill they will receive because it is in the hands of the gods. Just then, Famisha's brother teases her by saying that he is the only child in the family who got three stars, and wants Famisha to get one star just like her sister Facilla. Despite this, Famisha informs them that she wants to be a tamer who can be friends with dragons, griffins, and all kinds of monsters. Hearing this, everyone starts making fun of her, revealing that taming is the lowest skill in this world. But their laughter is stopped when someone knocks on the door. A woman named Miss Luba enters the house and informs them that the time for Famisha to be gifted with her skill has arrived, and she's here to offer a prayer of good fortune to her. Just then, it is revealed that when Famisha turned two years old, she started claiming that she got reincarnated into this world from another world. Her mother was worried that if she will be able to use magic or not, and for this, she summoned Miss Luba to look at this situation. Miss Luba, who is the fortune teller of this world, dismisses her concern, saying that her daughter will use magic. She then tells Famisha not to say anything about her reincarnation to anyone. Otherwise, people will make things very difficult for her. At present, Miss Luba looks at her and reveals that she will be gifted with a wonderful skill. When asked what kind of skill she will get, Miss Luba informs them that she has only a one-star foresight skill, which means she cannot see quite far. The next day, the family heads to the headquarters of the village where every child with the age of five gets their skills. There, the priest asks her to enter her finger into the holy water of the gods. Upon doing that, the priest reveals that she has been awarded a tamer skill. Feeling happy this, her parents begin to enjoy her daughter's skill, but their moment is cut short when the priest, with a horrified look, informs them that she has no stars, which means she has a starless tamer skill. Her father, shocked at this, asks the priest to look at the holy water of the gods again, believing that there must be some mistake. However, the priest brushes it off, saying that if they speak any further on this, they will be blessed with the wrath of the gods. After the priest leaves, they head home, and her father cannot stop thinking about why his daughter is born with no stars, while his other son and daughter have three and two stars. His wife, Famisha's mother, tries to calm him down, stating that there must be a mistake. Instead of listening to her, he starts questioning her loyalty to him, saying that Famisha is not his daughter and she must have an affair with someone else. This causes her to fall to the ground and cry. Famisha tries to help her mother out, but her brother grabs her from her arm and throws her out of the house. She asks for her sister and her father's help, but they turn their backs on her. 
After being thrown from her house, she runs into the chief of the village, who informs other villagers that a starless girl is in their village, and if they don't kill her, then the wrath of the gods will soon be upon them. Hearing this, Femisha starts running away, but some kids hit her with stones, causing her to bleed heavily from her head. After running for so long, she enters the nearby forest and begins feeling hungry. She tries to eat some berries, but due to heavy rain, she runs away to the nearby cave. There, she tries to make fire to save herself from the cold but ends up falling unconscious after using the magic multiple times. After waking up, she sees Miss Luba sitting in front of her. Miss Luba informs her not to use magic multiple times, otherwise, she will lose her life because of her weak body. She also informs her that her foresight already told her that this will happen to her, but she wasn't able to see why she ended up like this. She then gives Femisha her bag and book, telling her that whatever she puts in the bag will become light, and the book contains magical information which will help her as long as she is alive. She then tells her that one day, she will set off on a journey to see the world with her own eyes and broaden her perspective, and when she does, she tells her to go to the town neighboring the royal capital. There, if she finds a place for herself to live without any trouble, then there is no need for her to travel anymore. She then continues that if she finds any friends, then she must tell them about herself and having no stars because it will help them to believe in her, and when the time comes, they will become her allies and fight alongside her. Just then, Femisha asks Miss Luba why she is so nice to her while the others hate her and even tried to kill her. To which Miss Luba informs her that long ago, no one had skills or stars, but they still worked with each other and lived happy lives. Hearing this, Femisha feels happy and vows to do her best. A few days later, Femisha starts feeling lonely as Miss Luba stopped paying visits to her. Femisha, feeling hungry, traps a mouse and she starts eating it. Just then, she hears someone approaching her hideout and wonders how they know her hideout. She follows them to the town, and upon reaching the headquarters, she is shocked to hear that Miss Luba has died due to a cold fever. She feels bad at this, revealing that Miss Luba was the only person in this world who was nice to her. Just then, she sees her father approaching the chief of the village. The village chief tells him that he told Miss Luba multiple times to stay away from the starless girl. But she didn't listen to him, and due to this, she got cursed by the starless girl and died. Therefore, he wants no more casualties in the wrath of the gods and tells him to kill her daughter. Hearing this, Femisha's father agrees and decides to kill her daughter, revealing that there is no place for a starless girl in this world. Not wanting to believe that her own father wants to kill her, Femisha cries with heavy pain, and before they can kill her, she wakes up to find Sora jumping on her body. Shocked at this, our reincarnated girl wonders how she is alive but realizes that Sora has a healing ability and due to this, he healed her wounds. Just then, Sora starts speaking, causing our reincarnated girl to cry and believe that she is not alone anymore and she has someone who she can talk to. The next day, as Ivy woke up from her sleep, she was greeted by the caretaker of the adventurer field, who wished her good luck for her trip to the forests. Ivy thanked him for his kind words and went to the city, believing that the caretaker didn't realize she was a girl. On the way, she met a lot of adventurers who asked her about her health and told her if she needed any help, she just had to ask. Ivy also thanked them for their generosity but wondered how everyone knew who she was. At the forest, she came upon the destroyed traps which she had set up for the field mouse, but believed that this might be the work of Nanoshi. She believed that if this continued to happen again, she might not catch any mouse and go moneless during the summer. Just then, she sensed a magical aura behind her and when she looked back, Seal was already there with nine field mice whom she hunted down earlier in the morning. She gave them to Ivy and she thanked her with a heartfelt hug. She then began counting them but realized that the meat shop owner told her that she would only buy meat if it was fresh. So, with this, she started dressing them and it was over in a few minutes. After that, she went to Seal and Sora who were sleeping below the tree. She told Sora to wake up, saying that they needed to head to the town to sell this fresh meat. Otherwise, they would miss their chance to earn some money. As they talked with each other, Seal said goodbye with the wave of her hand, and Ivy thanked her for giving her so much meat. As she went to the forest, Ivy's past life informed her that this was the legendary Anandala which was mentioned in the fortune teller book. But Ivy believed that it wasn't savage like it mentioned in the book. Our weak reincarnated girl then went to the village and sold all the field mice to the meat shop. The owner couldn't believe since all the meats were fresh and weren't gamey at all, and asked Ivy about her secret. However, Ivy with hesitation, did not respond, causing the owner to realize that despite being a child, she has a good head on her shoulder and does not want to reveal her trade secret. With buying all the meat, she gave her 855 dal in exchange, 
and before leaving, she told Ivy to bring back field mice to her if she caught any in the field, and she would gladly buy them. Hearing this, Ivy thanked her for her kindness and left. On the way, she again met the same adventurers who asked her about her visit to the forest and how did it go, but I Ivy, with a horrified look, just nodded to them. She then hid herself below some boxes and wondered how everyone knew about her. Suddenly, as she was thinking about this matter, she was spotted by Velivera who asked why she was hiding in a place like this. Ivy told him everything, to which he realized that this was the work of Captain Ogto. He then told her that Ogto informed every adventurer in the village that if any of them came upon an adventurer named Ivy who was in trouble, they needed to help her out. He apologized to Ivy on behalf of Ogto, and then informed her that Ogto is a good guy. But once he gets something in his head, he doesn't listen to anyone. Ivy, after hearing this, thanked him and went to the market area. On the way, she again met some adventurers who wished her good health, and this caused her to believe that this place might be good for her to stay for a while. Just then, she came upon a shop and saw some zero fruits which were only grown in her hometown village. She asked the shop owner about this, and he confirmed. The shop owner then asked if she was from Latomi village, and our weak reincarnated girl confirmed, but she wanted some information about her village, so she asked him out. The shop owner informed her that the situation in the Latomi village was not good. Mistress Luba who had always protected the zero crops Latomi village, and was the fortune teller of the village, has died away. He revealed that this was all because of their idiot village head, who didn't like her, and when she fell ill, he didn't give her any medicine. This revelation brought back the words of the two women who she heard in the church saying, how can someone die with this cold at this time of the year? With this revelation, she realized that Mistress Luba's cause of death was not because of sickness, but she was killed at the hands of the village head. However, to her shock, the shop owner told her that the village head is now blaming this all on a child with zero stars, which caused her to go silent. The shop owner then went on to explain that the harvest of the Latomi village Zero has been failed and they fell into financial hardship. And with this, the village head has been trying to reduce the number of mouths to feed. Some of the villagers rebelled, took their families, and left the village, and others, who defied the head, were thrown out of the village. With all this revelation, the shop owner asked Ivy how she ended up in this town, to which she told him that her family sided with the village head and that caused some problems. And due to this, she ran away. Hearing this, the shop owner gave her a zero fruit and encouraged her to do her best, and she happily agreed. At night, she was thinking about her family and her village, and how they fell into the drastic situation, but then realized that she now has some friends who are kind to her, and most importantly, she has the memories of her past life. With this, she ate the zero fruit and revealed that this was the flavor she tasted when she was little. Suddenly, the past memories of Mistress Luba flooded into her mind, where the fortune teller told her to go to the neighboring town of the royal capital, and our weak reincarnated girl realized that she needed to remember this memory. The next day, after waking up, she again met the adventurers from yesterday, but this time, she greeted them with happiness and told them that she would do her best in the forest today. At the forest, she set some traps for the field mice, but suddenly sensed the movements of people. She asked Sora to quickly get inside her bag, and he obliged, but to her shock, the people were the same adventurers who tried to bully her a few days ago. They cornered her and asked her to give them her slime, believing that it was very rare. Ivy hesitated and ran away. She trapped one of the adventurers to her traps but the girl was too fast, and she quickly caught up to her. They then held her in their arms and asked her to give them her slime. Ivy again hesitated, but this time, the leader took out a knife and told her that if she did not give them what they wanted, he would not hesitate in killing her. Just then, they got shocked after seeing an Indala behind their back. Seal approached them, and seeing the legendary monster in front of their eyes, one of the adventurers passed out. The other one tried to run away but Seal caught up to him with her immense speed and then kicked the hell out of him. She then handed them over to Ivy, who thanked her for saving her life. Just then, Seal sensed something and headed back to the forest. It was Ogto and Velivra, who were patrolling the forest and hurried here, after hearing a monster's roar and human screams. They asked about her health and she revealed she was fine, however, they got shocked after seeing the three stars adventurers unconscious. At the Adventurers Guild, Ogto told her that the captured adventurers were wanted criminals in some crimes including a murder, and the Adventurers Guild was investigating them, but they did not have any proof about them. However, due to her help, they got them now, and for capturing those three stars criminals, she would be paid with reward money. Just as Ivy was wondering about this, Ogto informed her that the Adventurers Guild pays 5,000 dal for an average criminal, two gittle for a murderer, 
and for two murderers, they also offer a reward of one ladle each. With this, he told her that she would receive two ladle and three gittle. Our weak reincarnated girl, shocked at this, wondered what she should do. But Ogto presented her the reward money and told her to register an account in the trade guild, revealing that carrying this large amount of money would lead her to trouble. He then took her to the trade guild and registered her in it. The trade guild gave her a white plate, and Ogto informed her with that plate, she could withdraw her funds at the trade guild in any village or town. Our weak reincarnated girl thanked him for his kindness, but was met with the ferocious look from Velivra, who upon arriving, told Ogto that he was looking for him and then scolded him for wandering around without telling him. They then told her about this town's signature dish, Ananoshi skewers, and wanted to treat her with it, to which Ivy happily agreed. They headed to town's famous shop and ate the nanoshi skewers, which Ivy found very delicious. The shopkeeper who was making this nanoshi skewers revealed that she holds a four-star cooking skill, and there aren't many in this town who have a four-star skill. Hearing this, they began talking about each other's skills and asked Ivy about hers. Ivy revealed that she has tamer skill, but when asked how many stars she has, our weak reincarnated girl got silenced. This caused the adventurers to realize that they shouldn't have asked her this question. With this, both of them cheered her up, saying people with a lot of stars are totally useless because they fail to make use of their skill and end up taking the wrong path in their life. However, they believe that Ivy has only one star, but didn't realize that she was born with zero star. The next day, Ivy waved them goodbye, revealing that she promised the fortune teller that she would live in the neighboring town of the royal capital. She thanked them for their kindness, and Ogto, with a happy smile, told her that he would look forward to meeting her again. Just as she left, Velivra informed Ogto that he inquired information from the Latomi village, and found out that the villagers who left the village, Ivy's name was not on any of them. He revealed that most people left the village as whole families, but there was one eight-year-old girl who ran away. This revelation caused them to believe that Ivy has a secret and because of that, she was hiding her gender. Guys, please do 3000 likes and subscribe to support the channel. Please, it will help me create more videos. The next day, as they headed to the next city, Sora ran ahead with full of energy and Ivy chased him. She told him to slow down, but he didn't listen. Just then, her past life informed her that after eating the wounds of Seal, Sora had evolved and moved faster than before. Just as Ivy thought about this, Sora showed her a nearby field area which was dug up by Nanoshi. Ivy believed that there must have been many large Nanoshis in this area, and if she stayed there any longer, she might be chased by them. Just as she was about to move from the area, she heard something coming and quickly hid Sora in her. However, to her surprise, it was Seal who was following them. With this, she quickly hugged her and the trio shared a heartfelt moment with each other, with Ivy declaring she loved both of them. At night, Ivy baked some rabbit which was caught by Seal, and after eating, revealed that they were delicious. She offered some to Sora, who quickly declined after revealing that he only loved eating blue potions. The next day, Ivy went to check some of her traps which she had set up the day before for the field mice, but got shocked after seeing they were empty. She wondered what she would eat for breakfast, but her past life informed her that she had saved some meal from the night before. With this, Ivy believed that she would not be hungry that morning and decided to leave the area, but was suddenly stopped after sensing an evil aura approaching her. She wondered what it could be, but then started running away from it. The evil aura chased after her, and just as it was about to get her, Ivy looked at it and saw a shadow of a human body. Suddenly, Seal came to her rescue and yelled at it with a ferocious roar, which caused the shadow person to immediately run away. After that, as they headed to the city, Ivy thanked her for saving her life, saying that without her, she might have been dead right now. Suddenly, Seal stopped after seeing some ogres coming towards them. She quickly threw Ivy from her back and attacked one of the ogres. She then bit him with her long teeth, and the ogre slipped away from the mountain. But since Seal was on top of his body, she also fell with him and into the below water stream. Seeing this, Ivy was worried about her, but then saw another ogre coming after her and quickly ran away. Just then, she came upon an evil place where some skeletons were hanging on the top of the trees. She wondered what this place was and decided to run away, saying that if she stayed there, she might be killed. Just as she was about to leave the area, she was captured inside a trap set by the ogres earlier. She yelled for help, but no one listened, not even her savior seal, who had already fallen into the water stream. Just as one of the ogres was about to finish her, a flame spell quickly finished him off and burned him down. The flame spell turned out to come from an adventurer named Ladera, 
who explained that he had set up the traps for the ogres but was shocked to see a child inside it, since the flame spell burned the whole area and also affected Ivy. Another adventurer fired some arrows at the trap and quickly freed her. Latera, after saving her from falling, wondered why a child like her was here. Just before our reincarnated girl could speak up, they were attacked by some ogres. But to their rescue, Latera's group arrived and quickly eliminated them with their powerful magic. With the fight over, Ivy saw two big slimes which were protecting them both, and wondered how a slime could be so much bigger, but got blown away after the adventurers revealed their identity. They revealed that they were assigned here to eliminate the ogres who were recently spotted here, and then apologized to her for letting her get caught up in their business. However, Ivy thanked them instead, saying that they had saved her life. With this, they introduced themselves as a group of adventurers called the Blazing Sword, including their group leader Sazelk, Nauga, Shifail, Latera, and Mila. She also introduced herself as Ivy, but due to her boyish get-up, they didn't realize she was a girl. On the way, the adventurers were shocked after hearing from Ivy that she was on her way to Adol from Ladom village. They didn't believe her at first, but after hearing her story, they told her to come with them as there were some monsters in this area and they were also heading to Otala village. Hearing this, our reincarnated girl happily agreed and then walked with them. After that, they came upon a cliff and Sazulk showed her their camp, revealing that the remaining adventurers were residing there. Just then, she spotted something below the cliff, which turned out to be Seal, who was alive after falling from the mountain cliff. Ivy felt happy that Seal was alive, but thought that if the adventurers found out about her, they would immediately kill her. So, with this, she told Seal not to come here and hide somewhere else, and our tamed monster quickly agreed. They then took Ivy to their camp and introduced her to the other adventurers. They even showed her their tent, but then walked away, leaving Latera with her. Ivy looked at their behavior and wondered what was wrong. But to her surprise, Latera informed her that he was the cook of this group. He then informed her that he was bad at cooking, and despite giving his best, he still did not know how to cook a delicious meal. Latera explained that he had a three-star flaming skill, and every time he used it on the meal, he burned it down. Hearing this, Ivy decided to help him out and began making the meal instead of him, even teaching him how to cook it and what kinds of ingredients were used in it. After that, everyone was shocked at the sight of the meal, but upon trying it, they cried out with happiness, saying that they had never had a delicious meal like this before. They revealed that they had never thought in their life that monster meat could be so delicious, but our reincarnated girl believed that they didn't know about the ingredients and herbs used to make delicious meals. The smell of the delicious meal also caught the attention of Mila, who, after trying it, also found it very delicious. Sazelk and Nauga couldn't hold their excitement as they believed that this meal was perfectly cooked, aromatic and truly delicious. With this, Shifail thanked her on behalf of his group for making such a tasty meal, but then realized that it was Latera's duty to make a meal. He quickly scolded him for putting all the weight on Ivy's shoulders, but Ivy immediately shut him down, saying that they made it together, and Latera was the one who adjusted the heat of the fire for her, and because of that, they were able to make a delicious meal. This revelation saved Latera's life who, with excitement, fired some fire spells at the sky which turned out to be fireworks. Just then, Ivy's past life informed her that fireworks could become more beautiful with flame color reactions and metallic elements. Just as she was hearing this, Mila asked if she was alright, and Ivy informed her that if they had varieties of metal, they would be able to make even more beautiful flames with them. Mila showed her some metals and asked if she was talking about them, to which Ivy happily said yes. Now that she had acquired all the metals, she put them inside some clothes and asked Latera to shoot those upwards and burn them the way he did it earlier. Latera happily obliged, and it turned out to be the most beautiful sight in their life. With excitement, Latera threw all of them into the sky and the sky was filled with the beautiful scene they had never imagined in their life. Even all the adventurers were happy at this, including Seal too. After that, some of them headed to sleep while Latera and Sazulk tried to help Ivy in washing the dishes, but Ivy shut them down, saying that she would do the cleaning duty. However, after realizing her sentiment, Sazulk told her that they would help her with this, and she quickly obliged with a sweet smile. Seeing this, Latera hugged her and revealed that he always wanted a sweet little brother like her, but she failed, and Nauga took him away after knocking him down. After that, she headed to her tent and apologized to Sora for coming up late. She believed that Sora must be hungry, so she gave him some blue potions. Seeing this, Sora quickly jumped up with excitement, and Ivy told him that there were enough potions so he could eat as much as he wanted. After that, 
Just as she slept, all the adventurers were worried about her and her health. Sazelk told them that this child was too considerate of others. He explained that the anxious look he gave him when he told him to rest, and his happy expression when he asked him to help clean. It was all pointing towards the fact that this kid in his head thought that if he wasn't useful, he would be cast aside. Guys, please do 3000 likes and subscribe to support the channel. Please, it will help me create more videos. The next day, Ivy starts collecting old potions, believing that those potions will make Sora happy. Just then, she comes upon some slimes who are disposing of the trash just like Sora, and quickly learns that those slimes belong to Miss Mila. Ivy asks her about them, and Mila tells her that those are very rare slimes and the tamers who can control those rare slimes are afforded a high social standing in this world. Surprised at this, Ivy asks Mila if she knows or has seen a disintegrating slime, and Mila informs her that those are called super rare slimes and can be sold for quite a sum. Suddenly, Ivy senses the same presence she felt when the human-like shadow tried to capture her in the mountain, but the presence quickly vanished away when the adventurer's group put all of their trash in front of her. They inform Ivy and Mila that they have eliminated all of the ogres in this area and have completed their mission, so now they are returning to Otawa. Happy at this, Ivy treats them with the meal she made with her hands, and upon eating it, all of them feel happy to be alive from those delicious meals and ask Ivy how she can make such yummy dishes. However, Ivy is worried about Seal after listening from the adventurer party that they eliminated all monsters in this area. But to her happiness, her past life informs her that it is not a child's play to take down a legendary monster like a Ndala. And if someone attacked her, then there would be a huge fuss about it and everyone would have known immediately. As they eat, we see Seal looking at her from afar on the mountain, revealing that she is fine. After the meal, Sazelk tells Ivy to have some meal, believing that she hasn't eaten anything yet. But Ivy assures him that she has already eaten her meal, and if she eats more, her stomach would probably explode. Just then, Mila arrives with her brothers, and Ivy, upon looking at them, wonders how they look so similar. Mila introduces them to her and tells her that they are her twin brothers Tolto and Malma, and belong to the adventurer group Green Gale, whom she is the leader of. As they greet Ivy, they offer her to join their group, but Latteris shuts them away and after hugging Ivy, tells them that he is going to be their little brother. However, Sazilk knocks him down with a punch of his own. Just then, the twins see some adventurers heading their way and quickly leave along with their sister. Ivy asks what's going on, and Latter informs her that those adventurers belong to the Lightning King group and the Green Gale group does not feel comfortable around their captain Borolda. He greets Ivy and tells Sazelk to escort her to the Otala village, to which he happily obliges, revealing that this was their plan from the beginning, to which our reincarnated girl feels happy about it. At night, Ivy gives all the potions she collected to Sora, and Sora feels happy about it and starts jumping in joy. But Ivy tells him to stop this as she believes it will be problematic if someone finds out about him. Suddenly, she feels the same presence and tells Sora to get in the magic bag. She gets scared and believes that the presence is nearby. But before it gets even closer, Latera comes into her tent and asks for her help in making tomorrow's breakfast to which our reincarnated girl happily obliges. Just as he leaves, Ivy thinks about that presence and wonders what this could be. Just then, Sora begins to behave like the one when he saw that person with the illegal alcohol, and those murderers came close. Seeing this, Ivy believes that Sora has some kind of power to detect an evil person, and she tells him about the adventurers, and Sora jumps in joy after hearing their name. However, when she tells him about Miss Mila, Sora starts giving her the scary look, which, upon seeing, Ivy realizes that it could be Miss Mila who is following her. The next day, they arrive at the Ottawa village and one of the town's registrars tells her to add her name in the town's book. Ivy asks if it's okay to not add her hometown's name, but when they insist, she tells them that she is from Latomi village. Hearing this, the registrar knows what's happening in the Latomi village and asks if she has someone who is serving as a guarantor for her. Ivy gives them Captain Ogto's name and they are shocked to hear this, but when she gives them the white plate she got after registering her name at the trade guild, they believe in her words and the registrar quickly gives her the permit to enter Ottawa town. However, Latera takes her outside of the town and shows her the location where they are camping. But when asked why they are outside, Sazelk tells her that they have something important to share with her. Sazelk informs her that there is a danger lurking inside the town and the forest surrounding it, and it's not about the monsters. Borolda then explains that there is a criminal organization in the Otala village who is abducting people and selling them into slavery. He reveals that they got this information while being out from the village and tried to find their location. 
But someone told them about this and they quickly deserted their hideout. Ivy asks if the organization will come after her, to which Borolda informs her that the organization is specifically after the children, and a child like her, who is traveling alone, will be the perfect mark. Ivy gets shocked at this and wonders what she should do, but Borolda tells her to stick with their group until they find a way to destroy this organization. Just then, Sezok says that the organization doesn't do anything to expose itself and hopes to find some sort of clue. Suddenly, a reincarnated girl tells them that she was targeted and chased by them. Hearing this, one of the adventurers stops her and then activates a barrier magic with the help of a magic item. They reveal that this magic item is very rare, and when it's activated, no one can hear the words coming from it. With this, Ivy tells them that when she was in the forest, some presence chased her and tried to capture her. But when a monster appeared nearby, the presence ran away. She also tells them about what happened last night with Ladera, and everyone starts blaming him, believing that he is the culprit behind all this and is the one who is abducting other people. However, Ivy informs them that it is not Ladera, revealing that she has a strong sense to detect presence, and with a heavy heart, tells them that she suspects Miss Mila from the Green Gale. All the adventurers get shocked after hearing Mila's name coming from Ivy's mouth and ask if she is sure about it. Ivy says she is, but in her mind, thinks that she cannot reveal Sora's identity to them as he was the one who told her about Mila. At night, Ivy tells Sora about this and wonders what she should do, but to her surprise, Sora tells her that it is okay to tell them about him. This revelation brought back some of her old memories when the fortune teller told her that when the time comes, she will need allies who will fight by her side, and it is okay to tell them about her truth as secrets could become the reason behind people losing their trust in her. The next day, as she tries to tell them about Sora, they inform her that they have found a darker side of Mila, including her brother too. One of the adventurers explains that after Ivy told them about her, he tracked her movements and spotted all three of them in a secret talk with a traveling merchant. And when the merchant left, he asked them about the merchant, but they pretended, saying that he was lost and they only gave him directions. He reveals that Mila and her brothers were also using the magic item like them to hide their voice, believing that their secret business discussion must have warranted the use of it. Shifail explains that he went to the trade guild and looked into the traveling merchant, and found out that the merchant was here in this town for the first time and isn't conducting any business of note here. Hearing this, the adventurers believe that the merchant must be after something rare and valuable, otherwise, he must not have come to this town for just a random item. This revelation also triggers sadness in them as they all considered Mila as their friend. They also thank Ivy for this, revealing that she was the reason behind their lead. But to their surprise, Ivy asks if they really believe in her words. Lottera tells her that she didn't know them but still made food for them which was quite delicious, and this reason is more than enough for them to believe that Ivy is not someone who would lie to them. Hearing this, Ivy cries and believes that she is nothing to them, but still, they believe in her. Just then, she tells them that she is a tamer and the one who told her about Mila is a slime whom she tamed. She then shows Sora to them, and upon looking at it, they reveal that they haven't seen this kind of slime in their life, which is not only rare, but can talk too. Ivy also tells them that it has the ability to see through bad people, and upon looking at it, the adventurers believe that they cannot share this information with others. Otherwise, if the villains learned about this, Ivy would become their first target. Suddenly, her past life informs our reincarnated girl that this is the best thing she has done in a long time. Guys, please do 3000 likes and subscribe to support the channel. Please, it will help me create more videos. After introducing Sora to the adventurer's party, all the members cannot believe in their eyes as they have never seen a disintegrating slime like this in their whole life. One of the adventurers named Rickfeld feels Sora is very adorable and starts petting it on its head. As he plays with it, the other adventurer says that a slime like this is only mentioned in the legends and the stories, but they can't believe how Ivy got it. Just then, Sora gets tired of Rickvelt's petting behavior towards it, and Shifail throws him out of the tent after knocking him down with a punch. Latera says that Rickvelt is weak against adorable animals, and whenever he finds them, he starts petting them so much that they end up hating him. With this revelation, Sora takes a sigh of relief, and adventurers begin to test out its powers. They start with Rickvelt who says his name is Latera, and end up on Lockreek who says his name is Malreek. But Sora gives them the scary look, which upon seeing it, our reincarnated girl says they both are lying. The adventurers can't believe that a slime like it can see what's true and what isn't, but are happy that they have finally found something which will help them in this mission. They reveal that in the past, when they tried to capture the members of the organization, the traitors among them always leak their plan. 
but now believe that since Ivy is on their side, they will soon capture them. Suddenly, as they plan to capture Mila and her twin brothers, Ivy feels sadness and tells Latteris she can't believe Mila is a bad person. The other adventurers also cannot believe it too as they only think of her all this time as their friend. Even Rickvelt reveals he will capture her with his own hands as he wants to ask her about her cruel side. Borolda tells him to withdraw from this mission as it will prove very painful for him, but Rickvelt still insists as he is focused on getting his answers. Ivy then asks about the organization and when they started kidnapping people. Borolda says it all started 10 years ago. At first, the townspeople thought that the kids were going missing because they had fallen victim to monsters. But seven years ago, the adventurers confirmed the existence of the organization when they took over the escaped victims into their protection. Our reincarnated girl believes that 10 years is a long time, and if the organization has been active for that long, it means they are not just one, but many traitors in this town. Sazelk says he believes in Ivy's words and reveals that the last time they tried to capture this organization, they only ended up finding themselves in an empty building. Sazelk says only a handful of people were aware of their advancements and the Green Gale group was among them, but they only found out after the raid. Borolda apologizes to everyone, revealing that he was the one who brought them to this group because they were endorsed by a member of the nobility. Hearing this, Ivy asks if the noble and the Green Gale are friends, but Borolda tells her they are not, and the Green Gale only solved a problem that the noble had which led the noble to recommend their promotion to high-level adventurers. Ivy asks if it's common for the nobility to recommend adventurers for higher promotions, and Borolda says it's unusual because most of the nobility look down on adventurers. Ivy then asks how many jobs they completed for this noble, and Borolda reveals only one, which led them to believe that they were also assigned for the job by the noble once, but he didn't recommend their name for the higher promotion. With this, they realize that the noble was only using them so that he can see if they will become his allies or not. They also call each other idiots and believe that they are not fit for being adventurers as they didn't even notice a simple matter which only a seven-year-old child did. Hearing this, Ivy tells them with an angry face that she is nine years old and today is her ninth birthday. With this revelation, everyone starts clapping for her and wishing her a happy birthday, even saying next time they will celebrate her birthday properly and with celebration. Ivy, with a happy face, thanks them for this and thinks to herself that she didn't remember how many years it has been since anyone said happy birthday to her. Latteria still cannot believe Ivy is nine years old and is so good at cooking, but Ivy reveals to herself that this is because of her past life. Just then, Borolda tells everyone that if the traitor is among the nobility, that means they have to be ready for the consequences that will come after the revelation. Sazelk asks for Ivy's help and tells her that he will introduce her to Guildmaster and the other high-ranking adventurers, and her job is to tell him if he can trust them or not. Ivy agrees to his plan and heads to the Adventurers Guild. There, they meet the Guildmaster Rogleaf, Captain of the Watch Berksby, and the Vice Captain Agrop, and upon seeing them with its own eyes, Sora informs Ivy they are good people and are not the traitors. With this, Borolda shows them a blue stone and informs them that this is a magic item which he borrowed from Ivy. This magic item allows Ivy to tell if the person who spoke to her is good or bad. The Guildmaster cannot believe as they have such valuable item, but Ivy tells him that once it has been used, it will turn into a normal stone after a week. Hearing this, the Guildmaster asks for their help and tells them that he wants to use this stone to get information about the traitors who passed on the information about their investigation. Borolda agrees to his request and tells him that this was their intention from the start. With this, they begin their investigation and start it with the Merchant House, which they believe was being used by the organization as their base. They meet two watch guards at the doorstep, and Sora finds one of the guards named Malgajula a traitor among them. Berksby can't believe in his eyes as he thought of Malgajula as his friend and even told him about the information of the raid. After checking on 157 watchmen, they come to realize that 37 of them are traitors. They can't believe how many spies are among them, but get surprised after a visit from Count Faltoria and Lord Foronda. Faltoria greets everyone including Ivy, but when he goes near her, Sora informs Ivy that Faltoria is also a traitor. Ivy tells Borolda about this and reveals Foronda is not among them. As they leave, Borolda informs everyone about this and they can't believe a noble like him, who is also a hero to this town, is involved in such a guilty task. With this revelation, they believe that he must be the leader of the organization and all of their failed missions and the deaths of their friends are all because of him. 
Just then, Berksby cries and reveals he was the one who gave him the information, and believes all of his friends were killed because of him. But Borolda calms him down, saying that only people who are responsible for their death are the evil organization. He informs everyone to gather themselves as they need to catch them as soon as possible. But Sazelk, upon looking through a window, reveals that they are being watched. He explains that when Count Faltoria entered this room, he was only accompanied by Lord Foranda instead of the Watchmen, and this only means that the Watchmen were assigned to not leave their post at any cost. Sazelk believes they are hiding something in this base, but Berksby says they have checked every corner of this base and still find nothing. Just then, Ivy asks about Malvijula and where he was assigned to earlier search. She believes that Malvijula must have received orders from the organization and reported to the guild master that there were no issues in rooms that had issues. Hearing this, they head to the suspected room which was being guarded by Malvijula himself and orders him to watch over the other room. They look over the entire room, but still find nothing about the organization. Just then, Ivy's past life informs her that in the movies, people use trick bookcase in the room. Ivy wonders what movies are, but after seeing only one book whose corner of the spine was scuffed, she touches it with her hand and opens a new path behind it. There, they find boxes filled with gold and can't believe their eyes how much money the organization has collected so far. They even find out all the details of kidnapped people and kids and come to the realization that all the mission people were held in this base before being sold. With this revelation, Berksby tells them to put everything in the place they were before as they don't want the organization to believe they have found out about them. The next day, the adventurers party thanks Sora and Ivy for their assistance, saying that because of them, they have found out so much about the traitors. However, they also warn her to not go alone again as they believe some of the members are still after her. They inform her that if she needs anything, they will get it for her, but our reincarnated girl only wants to wash her dirty clothes. As she begins doing so, Latera asks about her gender and why she lied to them that she was a boy. Ivy, after hearing this, starts crying and informs Latera that she was hiding her true identity because it was more dangerous for girls to travel alone. Latera tells her that she should keep quiet about it from now, and he will pretend he doesn't know anything. Ivy thanks him for his generosity, but before she can say anything, Mila comes in and greets Ivy. She tells her to go with her in the town as there are places and delicious sweets she wants to show her. Ivy doesn't know what to do in this state, but Latera comes to her rescue and tells Mila that he will also go with them. At first, Mila denies his request, but when he hesitates, she tells him that she will treat all five of them with delicious sweets. Latera, upon hearing this, wonders who the other two are but gets surprised at the arrival of her twin brothers. They stare at each other, and Latera and Mila decide the matter with a rock-paper-scissors game, with Latera winning at the end. He then cancels the visit to Memroco and decides to head to Flawflow to eat something sweet. There, they meet the owner of the shop, who is a three-star cook and gives them his shop's best dish, which upon eating, everyone finds very delicious. The twin brother wants a second bowl as they find the dish very yummy, but Mila and Latera stop them, saying that they should take more to enjoy the sweet dish. Latera even gives them a demo, but our reincarnated girl finds it very creepy. Latera then asks the twin brothers about their sudden invitation, and they reveal that they heard a lot of good things from their sister about Ivy and want to know more about her personally, and that's why they decided to invite her. As they look at Ivy, Sora gives her a scary look and informs her that these people are very dangerous, and they are up to something very bad. Ivy gets scared at this revelation, but despite this, she still sits with them and pretends that she doesn't know anything about them. Just then, Latera takes out his sword and declares that if any of them try to harm Ivy, he will make sure that none of them will walk on their feet again. The twin brothers see this as a threat and reveal that they are only here to be friends with Ivy, not to attack her as they believe that Latera is her guardian, and they won't go up against his three-star flame skill. Latera says he knows their condition, but he has his own weakness because they have a two-star defense skill, and he has only three-star attack skill without defense. Hearing this, the twin brothers give a creepy smile and want to have a battle with Latera, believing that in this way they will find out who is stronger among them. But to their surprise, Mila stops them from doing this. She scolds them for their uncivilized behavior, but they make fun of her by saying that a girl with a tamer skill wouldn't understand this. They reveal that her taming skills are useless as she can only tame the lowest monsters like slimes, which are only useful in dissolving trash and are not capable of making more money. However, Ivy steps to her aid and says that Mila is amazing. She reveals that she has gone through this process already and believes that taking care of the trash is incredibly important work. She encourages Mila to not think what other people are saying and tells her that there will be some people who will think there is no value in this task, 
but there will be others who will treasure it. With this, Mila smiles and thanks her for those kind words. However, despite all this, her twin brother doesn't care about this as they only want a strong and showy skill that will bring them a lot of money. After that, Ivy and Latera say goodbye to the Green Gale and head to their camp. On the way, Latera asks about the sweet dish, and Ivy reveals it was very delicious. Latera then explains that he chose this shop for a reason, which was that the guy who runs that shop used to be a good adventurer, and no one can touch them on his shop. Latera says he saw through them and what they were planning, and so decided to avoid going to the place they suggested. Ivy's past life then informs her that if they had gone to their suggested place, they might have put drugs or something in the food. Latera says this was also a possibility but with a sad look, says they still don't know what to do with them despite knowing that they are traitors. Latera then shares his childhood memories and says when he was a little kid, children used to run freely around this town. We played with each other and when we did good things, the adults praised us but when they caught us doing mischief, they'd yell and give us a smack. He says this was a fun time, but since the organization came, wherever a child goes, an adult has to be there to watch over them. He reveals that now, the children are tied with adults and the town has become uncomfortable and restrictive for them, but vows that he will restore the peace this town used to have. With this, they head to their camp and inform the other party members about Green Gale's motives. Some of them believe that the organization is trying to kidnap Ivy, but Shifail wonders why they would go to such lengths to target Ivy in broad daylight. Latera says their motive must be to capture Ivy and sell her, but Nauga says they want to humiliate us as they already know that Ivy is protected by the Blazing Sword and the Lightning King group. Just then, Ivy's past life informs her that the Green Gale group is a decoy. With this, she explains to everyone that the evil organization is doing this for a purpose and they are using Green Gale as a decoy. She says if we catch up to Green Gale, we will believe that we have captured the traitors, and this will give them the chance to complete their work more easily as they have no one in pursuit. She then comes up with an idea and tells everyone to spread the news about the traitors in the whole kingdom. She believes that in this way, the organization will try to do everything in their power to not leak any of the information about their plans and will try to retrieve all the money and the documents they have left at the base. She says this will give us the chance to capture them. But Oranga says this might not be a good idea, as in this way Mila and her brothers will become wanted criminals across the kingdom, and they won't be able to be adventurers anymore. Ivy believes they must be using Mila and her brothers as sacrificial pawns, and once their role as a decoy is done, they will try to keep them quiet. Hearing this, Latera gives a worried look and wants to inform Mila about this, but Sezalk stops him from doing that, as he does not want to reveal their plan to them. Just then, Ivy says she wants to become a decoy, and then bait Green Gale to come after her. She explains that if we give them false information, like security at the base will be relaxed, they will come to retrieve the money and documents, and we will use this to capture them. Sazelk and Borolda say this is a good plan but they do not want to put Ivy's life in danger, and if they fight them head on, they don't know how many traitors are among the adventurers, and in this way, they won't be able to guarantee her protection. However, Latteris shuts them down by saying that he will protect Ivy with his life. With this, the Blazing Sword and the Lightning King group decide to follow Ivy's plan and tell everyone to start spreading the false information about the base. But Nauga and the others still feel they don't know much about the traitors among adventurers and wonder how they will know about them. Just then, Ivy comes up with another plan and tells everyone to introduce her to all the adventurers as she will use Sora's powers to detect who is a traitor and who is on their side. She says we will use a magic item to put the enemy to sleep when they try to retrieve the money and documents, and if our allies get caught in this, there won't be any problem since sleeping magic will not finish them off. Borolda and the others like this idea, but they still can't make up their mind as they do not want to put Ivy's life in danger. However, Ivy says this is their last chance to capture the organization as they still don't know about Sora and its powers. With this, Borolda agrees to her idea and tells everyone to get ready as they will strike the organization soon. He informs Guildmaster Rogleaf about their plan, who gathers all the adventurers upon his request. He introduces Ivy to all the adventurers and tells them that the Adventurers Guild has been charged with guarding Ivy's safety. He tells them to introduce themselves one by one to Ivy as he wants everyone to remember her face, and when she is in danger, they come for her aid. With this, Ivy begins looking at the adventurers and finds most of them traitors. In the meantime, Agrop and Captain Berksby share a deep conversation with each other. Berksby says he witnessed a smile on Borolda's face after so many years. He reveals that after the arrival of the organization, we have been troubled by the organization's crimes and grown weary of them. 
He explains that we tried to corner them many times but they fled away every time, and because of that, we have witnessed many casualties and some of them were our friends. Berksby says Boralda was among us who has lost everything because of this organization, but now he believes times are changing, and this is because of Ivy who has brought a smile not only to Boralda, but to himself too. Just as he finishes his thoughts, Shifail and the others come in and tell him to gather some adventurers as they need to go to the forest to eliminate a vicious monster. At first, Berksby wonders what they are talking about as they have already eliminated all the monsters near the town, but then realizes that it's a plan to counter the evil organization. He tells Agrop to go along with their plan and he happily agrees. As he leaves, Berksby asks Shifail about their plan but Shifail says he will not reveal it to him as he believes there are people who might be following them. Just then, Gabajula arrives and tells Berksby about Agrop who is gathering men for the monster raid, but Berksby says he told him to do so. Nauga says this might not be good as he believes that the organization will try to attack this base when they are gone, and suggests Berksby to tell Gabajula to pick some men for the base. Berksby agrees to his plan and tells Gabajula to do so, who immediately agrees after hearing it. Just as he leaves, Berksby again asks Shifail about their plan and Shifail shows him the magic item which is used to put people to sleep. He reveals that they are planning to capture the traitors, and for this to work, they need to put their allies to sleep as well. Berksby can't believe that Borolda and the others have come up with this insane idea, but to his surprise, Shifail says this is Ivy's idea. With this, Gabajula gathers all the required adventurers and Borolda feels happy that everything is going according to their plan. Berksby says he placed some allies in his group as he believes that most of the men Gabajula picked for guard duty are traitors. While the other traitors among the Agrop group, Borolda says he will take them as far as he can, in case if they run riot, they won't be able to harm the town's people. On the other side, Mila thanks Ivy for standing up for her and invites her for another sweet meal, and this time, she wants to go to Mamoroko, to which Latera and Ivy happily agree. With this, they head to Mamoroko and Latera tells our reincarnated girl to prepare herself as they are entering inside the belly of the beast. Inside the Mamoroko shop, our reincarnated girl Ivy can't decide what to pick as there are so many sweets, but Mila suggests she should go for the Danzu. Latera stops her from doing this as he reveals Danzu is very dangerous, and one bite of it makes the person faint. Mila says it will be fine and informs the shop owner to prepare Danzu for each. Latera tries to stop the shop owner and tells him to cancel the order, but the shop owner, named Mr. Hack, tells him that this is Ivy's first visit to his shop, and she has the right to experience the sweetness of Danzu. Just then, as Mr. Hag heads to prepare the sweet Danzu, the slime informs Ivy that Mr. Hag is also a bad guy. With this, she informs Latera about this, and they start their plan. Latera tells the Green Gale group that the reason he came to this sweet meal is that he has something to share with them. Just as he starts telling them about the mission, Mr. Hag closely listens to their conversation. Latera then reveals that a special unit of watchmen and adventurers is being put together to head to the forest for a special mission. He explains that when they are gone, the security in the town will be shorthanded, and this will give the organization the chance to attack the base. At first, the Green Gale group couldn't believe this and asked for the reason behind their sudden departure. Latera says they have spotted an ogre king and ogres in the cave near the forest, and the special unit is heading there to eliminate them. With this, Latera asks for their help, revealing that their talent is extraordinary and they will be a big help, and the trio happily agrees to his request. Just then, Mr. Hag hears this and quickly puts sleeping potions into two of the five bowls of Danzu. He gives them to Ivy and Latera, and he quickly leaves the shop and runs away to the town. A reincarnated girl, Ivy, sees this and tells Latera to proceed to their next step. With this, Latera quickly reveals his true intentions and asks the Green Gale about their connections with the organization and why they are helping them out. At first, the group can't believe what he is saying, but when Latera gives them the mixed bowls to eat, they finally reveal their true faces. Mila tells her brothers to stop this, as she can't do this anymore. But the twins don't listen to her words and take out their weapons to attack Latera. Latera says he does not want to fight them, but the twins begin attacking him with a sword and knife. However, they are no match for Latera, who has a 3-star attack skill while they have a 2-star defense skill. Latera attacks one of the twins with his flame spell to teach them a lesson, but the other twin blocks it away with his water spell. They feel horrified at Latera's powers, but despite this, they believe that they can still take out Latera and then try to attack him. Just then, Mila takes out her slimes and sends them towards her brothers, causing the slimes to dissolve their knife and sword. This gives Latera an opening, 
and he quickly takes them out with his own sword. Our reincarnated girl Ivy, who is seeing all this, can't believe what Mila had done and asks the reason behind this, and she apologizes to them while revealing that she was tired of all this. Instead of punishing her, Ivy thanks her for her help and reveals that because of her, they are alive now. Suddenly, the owner of the Flawflow shop comes in and asks Latera about the mess they have created. Latera tells him that the twins are members of the organization and asks for his help by taking them to the Adventurer's Guild. In the meantime, the members of the organization raid the base and start attacking the guards. Some of them show the sign of the organization to one of the guards, who is revealed to be a traitor and also a member of their organization. They ask him to take them to the library. The guards do so and give them directions, but they don't realize that some of the guards are with the guildmaster and they are watching them. With this, the head of the organization, Count Faltoria, comes into the room and informs his members to take out all the money and documents as soon as possible before the special unit's arrival. The members do so, but they get shocked after seeing a magic item inside the room, which is revealed to be sleeping gas and quickly spreads throughout the whole base. The noble and all the traitors try to run away, but they fall into the special unit's trap and quickly fall asleep. In the meantime, Berksby and Agrop lead the traitors to the front, while Sazel can borrow the lead from the back. On the way, they believe that the traitors are trying to take them out with a surprise attack, but they don't know that we already know about them. Just then, Berksby shows Agrop a magic item, and Agrop can't believe that a kid like Ivy can think of this, but Berksby corrects him by revealing that this was Shifil's idea. With this, they observe the movements of the adventurers, and just before they can hit them with arrows, Agrop quickly blocks their attack, and Berksby captures them inside a net with the help of a magic item. Some of the traders resist and try to free themselves from the net, but Berksby takes them out with an electric shock. With this, Agrop, Sazelk, Borloda, and the other adventurers begin their assault on the other traders, and before the traders can do anything, they are captured by the adventurers. One of the traders and the head of the watchman, Gabajula, says to Berksby that they are not members of the organization. But Agrop can't fall for his words and takes them out with his own lightning spell. While they take out the traders, some of their allies also get caught up in this and tell Berksby to quickly free them. But Berksby simply apologizes to them by saying that he will remember their assistance in capturing the traitors. Now that they have captured all the traitors inside the town and among the adventurers, they thank Ivy for this and reveal that because of her, they are able to achieve this milestone. Count Faltoria tells the adventurers to free him, otherwise, they will regret this. To his surprise, Lord Foronda comes to their aid and informs Faltoria that he already knows about his evil deeds. He reveals that he already sent a messenger to the royal capital, and they have been informed of the details of this case, which means Faltoria will be punished for his deeds. Just then, the people of the town come in and demand the adventurers hand over the traitors to them. Captain Berksby tries to calm them down, but the crowd doesn't listen and tries to break the gate of the base. Just then, Berksby informs them that they have captured the traitors, but they still don't have enough evidence about them, and that's why they can't show their faces to them. The crowd still resists and tells the captain to hand them over as they want to kill them with their hands. Berksby understands their feelings and says that if they kill them now, it will be a low punishment for them. He explains that he wants the traitors to suffer more every single day for what they have done to their children, and for this, he will send them to slavery. He reveals that slaves are sent to a harsh place, a place where they can't even choose to die. And if you people kill them now, their suffering will end easily. Hearing this, the people of the town agree to Berksby's words and promise that they will not lay a finger on them. Our reincarnated girl Ivy sees this and believes Captain Berksby is awesome, as he saved a lot of innocent lives. Latera says he is, and he again thanks Ivy for her help. Ivy then reveals that she wants to be powerful like Berksby, but Latera and Shifail tell her not to follow in Captain Berksby's footsteps. Berksby gets angered at this, but thanks Ivy for her help, revealing that this was not possible without her help. With this, they head to their final step and ask Ivy to detect all the adventurers and guards who were with the traitors. Our reincarnated girl Ivy looks at the people and believes there are many, and how she will handle them, but the slime tells her not to worry as he is ready for this. Like and comment if you enjoy this video, subscribe to my channel for more anime recaps, and tell me what anime recap you like to see next in the comments below.